greetings from Government Medical College, Kodikod, which is one of the largest referral centers in this part of South India. And we cater to a large number of patients from the six Northern districts, most of whom are struggling not only with disease, but with socioeconomic constraints. Next slide. Calicut or Kodikod as the district is known as, is renowned for the spice trade, the fine muslin calico cloth from which the name Calicut was derived. We had the landing of Vasco da Gama in 1498 right here. And uh, it was, Calicut was a port of call for the Portuguese, Dutch, Chinese, Arab, and British sailors. And uh, the boat which you see on the right side is known as the Uru, that is still made in Beipur near Calicut. And after the visits by these various uh, nationalities, sailors of these various nationalities, I would say the rest is history and possibly population genomics as well. This is the Atlas of Braun and Hogenberg from the 16th century. It shows a lot of activity happening in the sea, not much in land, just to show that a maritime activity was very, very important those days. Next. So we have been practicing pediatrics for uh, more than two decades now. And then there were some perturbing questions that we had. One was, why do some children spend their lives in hospital, receiving one half antibiotic after the other? Why do a few children die from innocuous infections? And why do child deaths recur in certain families and not in others? And the most important question, can we make a difference? Look at the pedigree chart on the right. You can see this is a pedigree of uh, one of our children with hyper IgM syndrome. You can see he has lost four maternal uncles and one sibling, male sibling as well. It was an X-linked hyper IgM syndrome. Next slide. So what do we mean by unusual infections? Well, they could be unusually severe, unusually persistent, recalcitrant to treatment, recurring now and again, or they could be atypical in their site or the organism. So if you have unusual infections, the questions we usually ask is, one, is there increased exposure to pathogens as when a child starts going to school? Second, is there an anatomical defect as when you have infections localized to one organ system? Or is the child immunocompromised? If the answer is yes, is it an inherited or primary immune deficiency disorder? So the challenges that we had at the start were that there were absolutely no estimates of primary immune deficiency or inborn errors of immunity as it is now called in this part of the country. A total lack of awareness among healthcare providers, including pediatricians, poor availability of immunological and molecular genetic testing, and we had to cover vast distances to access tests in premier centers. And of course, our naivet, which I would say was an opportunity as well as a challenge. Next. So this was a project that was a collaborative project undertaken by CSIR IGIB and Government Medical College Code Code. It was titled The Molecular and Genetic Characterization and genotype-phenotype correlation of children with primary immune deficiency disorders in a tertiary care center in South India. So uh, this was the beginning of a larger program on primary immune deficiency disorders. This was one of our first patients, a seven-month-old baby boy who had pneumonia, ear infections, diarrhea, persistent fungal infections in the mouth from very early in infancy was failing to thrive, was pale, febrile, and emaciated. And he had pneumonia, he was breathless, and had a low absolute lymphocyte count. You can see the pedigree chart on the right. He had already lost one male sibling when we saw him. Next. This was the antibody assay and the lymphocyte subsets. You can see immunoglobulins IgG, M, and E were really low. And the lymphocyte subset showed low T cells, 
CD4 and CD8 and low B cells. So it was a combined immune deficiency and the NK cells were actually elevated. Next. So this child was in the PICU, had been ventilated once, was treated with broad spectrum antibiotics and a viral infection, which was cytomegalovirus and is very common with, in children with severe combined immune deficiency. The child required critical care, already said that, and he had been started on multiple monthly infusions of intravenous immunoglobulin and antimicrobial prophylaxis. The diagnosis was confirmed at IGIB by whole exome sequencing. It was indeed severe combined immune deficiency. There was a missense variation, homozygous, in the recombination activating gene, RAG1. And this child underwent a bone marrow transplant at less than a year of age from a matched sibling donor. As you know, severe combined immune deficiency is not compatible with life beyond infancy. He did very well after that and is now off all drugs and off all immunosuppressants after 15 months of transplant. This was really our first success story of a primary immune deficiency disorder who had undergone genome sequencing. So this is, a, you can see the child looking very sick on the left and at two years, six years, and now at eight years, it was his birthday last week and he had sent us this uh, very nice photograph. So from uh, the previous story of Asif, what we learned was even if you have a primary immune deficiency disorder, which is lethal, you can save life, save the child's life by early diagnosis and intervention. The next story was of a boy called Haroon. The names have been changed uh, to protect their privacy. He presented at one and a half years of age with the recurrent ear and chest infections and diarrhea. So you can see the infections were not localized to any one system. He was asymptomatic until six months and had been hospitalized more than 10 times due to respiratory infections. Strangely, he presented not alone, but along with his male cousin. So they were both in the ward together and both had a history of recurrent infections involving various uh, organ systems. He belonged to a large extended family he was pale and emaciated. His tonsils were not visualized and he had been immunized to age. Immunological tests were done and we found that he did not have any lymphopenia, unlike the previous child. His nephelometry showed negligible antibody levels and lymphocyte subset showed virtual absence of B cells. So the diagnosis Really, the clinical diagnosis was an X-linked A-gamma globulinemia presenting after six months because he was protected until then by maternal antibodies. Next. So whole exome sequencing was done at IGIB, but it revealed absolutely nothing. So the scientists there decided to go in for whole genome sequencing, and they found a large hemizygous deletion encompassing exons three to five of the BTK gene, which is mutated in X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. So finally, we had confirmed the diagnosis in this child. This was a pedigree chart of the extended family. There had been five children affected. You can see only four which are colored because number 15 uh, of the fourth generation had not undergone sequencing at that time. Number 16 is the one who was diagnosed earliest. He was diagnosed at five months of age because we already knew the diagnosis in the family. And uh, individual number 18 was diagnosed very late at uh, around 14 years of age and had bronchic tasis. And the age of diagnosis and at which we start intravenous immunoglobulin actually determines the prognosis of the child. Next. We went on to do extended family screening for them. This is a visit to the house 
of the child. Uh, there were five affected individuals in the large family. And the gross deletion, which was a novel deletion, was screened by MLPA. 17 individuals underwent screening. And seven carriers were detected. And genetic counseling was undertaken by our pediatric uh, genetic clinic faculty. And they had to do it online because we were already in the pandemic. And uh, we had found that 22 male children had actually expired in the family before a diagnosis had been made. Next slide. So uh, from the story we just heard, we were able just by identifying the variant in one particular child to scale down from technology intensive whole genome sequencing to cheaper and more easily available MLPA, which would really benefit the family. The third story I have for you was of a 15-year-old boy who presented with recurrent pneumonia, ear infections, oral ulcers, and arthritis. So it was not just infections, but he also had considerable uh, problems with autoimmunity. He was confined to his home on medical advice, was never sent to school, never went out to play with other children. When people visited, he was in room confinement, not only home confinement. He had low immunoglobulin levels except for IgM, which was elevated, and he had normal lymphocyte subsets. The pedigree chart on the right shows that um, he had lost a maternal uncle and he had one normal female sibling. His mother and sister were found to be carriers. Next slide. He was started on regular intravenous immunoglobulin and antibiotic prophylaxis. He became asymptomatic. The family became confident. He started seeing his peers. His mother, who used to go only up to the corner shop on very essential errands, started attending social gatherings. And finally, we transitioned him over to adult care. Exome sequencing at IGIB revealed a hemizygous frame shift deletion in the CD40 ligand gene. So he was having an X-linked hyper IgM syndrome. He's now attending plus two classes online and family screening was done at MRU. And there's an interesting story the mother always likes to tell us. So when the child was around 15, they had a teacher who used to visit. And the child said, well, uh, I would like to have an aquarium. I want to rear fish at home. So the teacher said, that's not a very good idea. Fish should be free to swim in rivers and lakes. The child said, then aren't I also a living creature? Why was I confined to the house all these years? So that was a, a, a very, very uh, sad story that mother used to say. Next. So this is a map uh, showing the various variants and the location from which the patients actually came to us. And uh, what we feel is that we have so much data, sequencing data, genomic reports, but what is lacking is a network of genetic counselors for us to make all this information useful uh, for the family and the community. Next. From primary immune deficiency disorders, we slowly, uh, found that we were transitioning to autoimmune, uh, autoinflammatory disorders, of which HIDS is the prototype. And we have a large cohort of hyper IgD syndrome now. Uh, Dr. Vinod and Dr. Sandhya had already done a lot of work on autoinflammatory syndromes before we started. And what we found was the most common manifestations seen in more than three fourths of our cohort were rash, recurrent diarrhea, lymphadenitis, and hepatosplenomegaly. So gastrointestinal symptoms were very common. And half, more than half of our cohort has arthritis, recurrent aphthe, and recurrent infections. And the least common were recurrent abdominal pain, vomiting, and flares on vaccination. That's a new thing that we were seeing. Next slide. Uh, can we go to the previous slide, please? So we have a poster 
which was made at uh, IGIB and Calicut together. And it shows uh, just uh, the important signs and symptoms that a pediatrician needs to look for, for suspecting a child to have a hyper IgD syndrome when they're present with the recurrent fever. Uh, this uh, poster was actually shared through the Indian Academy of Pediatrics all over the state. Next slide. So the hyper IgD syndrome, which we had only read in textbooks about, needs to be considered upfront in children with recurrent or periodic fever. And very strangely, it is often associated with the recurrent infections as well. So there's a lot of overlap between the immunodeficiency phenotype and the auto-inflammatory phenotype. Onset during infancy is the rule. And although it's difficult to get total IgD levels, elevated IgA is a useful clue. And from our practice, we found that fewer flares were observed on cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. The hotspot variants were identified at IgIB and are now being screened for at the multidisciplinary research unit at Government Medical College, Kolikod. So the team at IgIB had all the data from the patients and they decided uh, that early diagnosis could really turn things around for families and we could not agree more. So a low cost newborn screening assay, a newborn screening tool for T cell receptor excision circles and copper deleting uh, recombination excision circles was developed, which enumerates TREX and CREX representing T cell and B cell precursors. It is actually used in several countries of the world, including all states of the US for routine newborn screening. Our institute has one of the largest birth cohorts in the region. And uh, we have just pilot tested this test uh, among critically ill neonates. And we hope that in future, it could possibly be included in the newborn screening, which is already in place for inborn errors of metabolism and congenital hypothyroidism. So early diagnosis leads to reduced mortality and definitely improved outcomes. Offshoot projects that have happened include sanction being accorded for the Nidan Kendra under the DBT UMID initiative and a study on polio and non-polio enterovirus infections, uh, which is being conducted by uh, WHO India and ICMR NIV. So in summary, we have screened around 600 children in hospital who were either admitted in the wards or who had attended our primary immune deficiency clinic, which happens every Monday. 226 patients were evaluated genetically. 115 variants were identified at IGIB. 15 children had the micro deletion suggestive of Dijod syndrome. 11 novel variants were discovered. 17 patients each had been started on regular IVIG prophylaxis and 17 underwent hematopoietic stem cell transplant, most of them at Apollo Hospitals Chennai. Uh, Dr. Avery Raj was really um, responsible for this. Hotspot variants of the BTK, CD40 ligand, and mevalinate kinase genes are being screened for now. 60 carrier screens have been performed and seven families accessed prenatal diagnosis. It's really uh, wonderful when we are able to offer prenatal diagnosis, which uh, along with CSIR IGIB, we had uh, the CSIR Institute at Hyderabad, which was our CSIR CCMB also helped us a lot. Next slide. So uh, we realized that creating awareness was really the key to moving forward and reducing the burden of disease due to primary immune deficiency disorders. Uh, you can see uh, Professor Dan Kastner, who actually gave us a talk. He's a doyen on, in the field of auto-inflammatory syndromes. And uh, on the right, lower down, you can see a book for families in the local language Malayalam. And another souvenir, which was brought out 
on an occasion of a CME, Spotlight on Primary Immune Deficiency Disorders for Pediatricians. Next. So what was the impact on patient care and practice? Well, there was, there definitely is enhanced awareness of primary immune deficiency disorders. We are getting earlier referrals. More and more pediatricians are aware. Diagnosis of hitherto unrecognized disorders, especially auto-inflammatory syndromes, is happening. Vastly improved in-house diagnostic capability uh, is now there. We have started doing Sanger sequencing, uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization, along with uh, the other techniques for immunological assays, including nephilometry and uh, for, um, flow cytometric analysis for the lymphocyte subsets. There is improved clinical diagnostic skills. And believe me, once you see uh, one of these rare diseases, it's really true to form. So when you see a second patient, it presents in an identical um, fashion, and it is not difficult to uh, hazard a guess as to the diagnosis. So we are be becoming slightly better at recognizing patterns. And looking beyond the patient is now a priority. And we not only ask what the questions what and which, but also are getting used to asking questions like how and why. Next slide. Looking ahead, what we hope will happen in future includes routine newborn screening for severe primary immune deficiency disorders like skin, severe combined immune deficiency, and X-linked A-gamma globulinemia through TREC-CREC screening. Improved access to curative options, including gene therapy, because if a child does not have a matched sibling donor, the cost of a hematopoietic stem cell transplant is astronomical. So we hope that things would happen in the field of gene therapy for the better. The possibility of rapid next generation sequencing for children in extremis. Uh, Dr. Anurag Agarwal also uh, spoke about this already. Enhanced availability of genetic counseling services is really key to making a difference and reducing the incidence of these disorders. And we hope that one day there would be a center of excellence for pediatric immune disorders in South India. Next slide. So from the team at Government Medical College Code, Code I really like to express uh, my gratitude to CSIR IGIB and the Guardian Consortium, uh, Dr. Sridhar Shiva Subhu, Dr. Vinod Skaria, and Dr. Anurag Agarwal. We also like to remember Abhinav Jain, who was a research scholar and was working very closely with us. The Science and Engineering Research Board, DHR, setting up the multidisciplinary research unit, NIIH Mumbai, who helps us when we are stuck with immunological tests, Apollo Chennai, Dr. Sandhya Pulukul from St. Stephen's, Delhi, Dr. Krishna Kumar from Institute of Metal, uh, Mental Health and Neurosciences, and the Foundation for Primary Immune Deficiency Disorders, and uh, Dr. Sudhir Gupta. Uh, thank you so much uh, for a patient listening.